trying to solidify some things. Um, this morning, I want to start a little bit of a series here, which is probably the heart of this. You got it going, Mama? All right, she's got it going. She's professional now. That's first rodeo for you, isn't it? All right. Good for you. Something new. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2. Um, at the heart of this doctrine of eternal security, we, we've gone over a bunch of stuff in the New Converts class, but one of the things that is seems to be uh, overlooked, um, sometimes not even thought out very well, is this thing about losing your salvation. Now, I'm going to tell you, there's only two groups. There's only two groups that I know of, that I'm aware of, and one of them is a false group. <laughs> There's only two groups <clears throat> that teach the security of the believer. And one of those is, is Baptist. But the other, which a, Bab a lot of Baptists have gone this direction, is Calvinist. Um, one thing we have in, in common with Calvinists, we believe in, in the preservation of the saint, not the way they believe it. They believe only the elect is part of that group, and God's already pre-selected them. We don't believe that at all. He knows who they are. That's the difference. And so I'm not going to get in. We, we've taught against Calvinism many times. Ran into a Calvinist door knocking Thursday, and I hope to go back and sit down and talk with him. But churches that are associated with Calvinism um, traditionally have been the Anglican church and the Presbyterian church, but it's, it's sad how many Southern Baptists that would include Vody Bachman and John MacArthur, all that crowd. They're all Calvinists, y'all. They're all Calvinists. And so it's, it's creeping into independent Baptist churches too. Now, I'm not an Arminian. I don't believe you can lose it, right? It's not mine to lose. I believe this week and next week at the heart of this doctrine, the two things I need to cover, first of all, is whose righteousness is enough to get you to heaven. See, if you understand whose righteousness it is, you'll understand why you can't lose it. If it was your righteousness, you could lose it. You, you, you absolutely could lose it. That's very clear. Because you're sinful, you're wicked. All our righteousness is filthy rags, Isaiah 64, 6. But, if it's God's righteousness, and He keeps it, which we're going to see, See, this is what a lot of people don't understand who believe you can lose it. It's not your righteousness to begin with. And so we're going to do that study and solidify it. Here's another doctrine we're going to look at next week and look ahead to this doctrine. When you're born again, you have a new benefits package. You're no longer seen as an enemy. Now you're a child. So... In the scriptures, very clearly taught, is the difference between an enemy and a child. We'll go over that next week. If, if, if someone were to break into my house in the middle of the night, and I, I grabbed that pistol by the nightstand and, and went to go clear the house, got by the refrigerator as one of my children, I'm not going to draw and, 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 and treat them, mistreat them. I'm going to say, hey, what are you doing? Why didn't you call me? I... I if you wanted something to eat, stand in the refrigerator. Why didn't you call me? I'd have got you something to eat. But if I walk in that kitchen, and it's a stranger I don't know, there's a different set of rules that are going to apply. Now, I'm not going to shoot first unless I feel threatened. But there's a different set of rules now, right? And so it's that way when we're in God's uh, family. There's a different set of rules once we're born. And it's, it's not a double standard you have accepted the fact that now you're His child and you're going to behave as His child. That's, that's what God expects from you, right? You're no longer treated as an enemy. An enemy it gets nothing but wrath, y'all. There's wrath upon the enemy. The child is, is given mercy, uh, is given forgiveness, is given long-suffering. So we'll look at that next week. And you can see, if you want a little glimpse of that, just read Ephesians chapter 2, the rest of the verses, after what we're going to read this morning in preparation for that. This week I want to go over the fact of whose righteousness is it. We'll start with uh, Ephesians chapter number 2, verse 8. For, uh, 
For by grace are you saved through faith, and it not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Is it a gift or isn't it a gift? The Bible says it is a gift of God. Do you see that? Now watch verse 9. Not of works, lest any man should boast. So salvation is a gift of God, clearly explained. Not of works, lest any man should boast. But it doesn't mean there's not works that follow. Look at verse number 10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto, do you see that? Good works. So we're, we're not saved by good works, but we're saved unto good works. The works follow the salvation. Your works have nothing to do with salvation. The work of salvation completely is, is God giving you a free gift in exchange for your faith. And that's what you find in the Scriptures. So we see it's not of works. Go to 1 Peter chapter number 1. 1 Peter 1. Uh, Brother Peter puts a few pieces of this puzzle together for us. And I'm thankful for this. <clears throat> I want you to see this. 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, Elect according to foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctification of the Spirit to the obedience of the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Elect according to foreknowledge. Notice elect according to foreknowledge. It's not, it's not elect because He elected you. It's elect because He knew the choice you would choose. Right? So elect according to foreknowledge. And we can go over election some other time. If you want to read Ephesians chapter number 1. That's a strong passage that Calvinists try to use. It's not strong in favor of Calvinism if you read it in context because the faith is what brings the election, right? It, he, he died for all, but when you put your faith in Him, it, that's what brings that election. It's not, it's not uh, something He did way back then and this group is going to hell and that group's not going to hell. That would be unjust. It's not a just God who selected certain ones to go and other ones not, and didn't give you a free will. And by the way, if a Calvinist says he believes in free will, you've got to ask him, do you really believe a person has a legitimate choice? Because to a lot of these Calvinists, the one I was talking to on Thursday, he believes in free will, and then he puts a little caveat in there for the elect. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Everybody has a choice. Otherwise, God is unrighteous and we know He's not. Everybody has a legitimate choice. If He says that you can believe, then you have to be able to believe. If He says preach the gospel to every creature, then every person must have an option. Look at this, verse number 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His abundant mercy, hath begotten us, there's that new birth, again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven. Look at, look at the terminology. He begotten us. Can you unbegotten a babe that's been begotten? You understand? Look at this. You have reservations. If you have reservations, do you have, does, and God gave you reservations in heaven, are those reservations going to endure? I'll show you why they endure. Verse number 5 tells you why. Who are kept by the power of their flesh. Is that what it says? Who are they kept by? It's the power of God. Listen, I don't keep my salvation because I'm good. He keeps it because He's good and He's righteous. We're not kept by our flesh. And this is a misunderstanding for a lot of people. We're kept by the power of God. Now, let me say something to you. Does that mean that we believe, because this will be the accusation you're going to get if you believe that, we can live any way we want to live. Listen, we do not believe. We believe whom the Lord loveth, He does what? Here's that child thing again. Here's that child thing again. We're not enemies. You know why we're not enemies? He chastens us for our benefit to bring us to righteousness. You know what He does with His enemies? He annihilates them. He chastens us to make us better. And so we believe that God, whom He loves, He chastens. And so you're not getting away with anything. You're not getting away with anything. You're going to be corrected if you're His child. 
another manifestation that we're kept by the power of God. Notice, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last days. Let's go to Romans. Romans. We're going to spend some time in the book of Romans. Romans chapter number 10. I'm not necessarily going to go in order in the book of Romans, but I want you to see, we're going to, I'm going to establish a logic using the book of Romans and let you see the, the pattern that's given by the Word of God. Not my Word, but God's Word. He says, brethren, verse number 1, Romans 10, verse 1, My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. He says, for I bear them record. Look at this. Watch this. That they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Now watch. It says, for they, being ignorant of what? What are they ignorant of? And going about to establish what? You see the difference? If you're ignorant of God's righteousness, and you go about to establish your own righteousness, you can lose it, because it's your righteousness, it's not God's. See, that's the problem with Israel. They were ignorant of God's righteousness. Going about to establish their own righteousness have not, what? Submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Listen, a person submits themselves to the righteousness of God, they receive a gift that we're going to read about here in a minute. Listen, it's about God's righteousness. It's not about your righteousness. It's all through the Scriptures. Listen, if it's God's righteousness, how can I lose God's righteousness that's given as a free gift. Watch this. Watch this. Let's go to Philippians. We'll, hold your, we'll, we'll come back to Romans. We'll go to Philippians. Paul talks about his righteousness prior to knowing Jesus Christ. He um, kind of spends a little time, and he has to put a little um, disclaimer in there that, you know, I, 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 I'm going to speak as a fool just for a minute. But watch what he says here. Finally, brethren, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things unto you indeed is not a grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of concision, the concision, for we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and truth and rejoice in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in what? Philippians 3, verse number 3. Sorry about that. I didn't tell everybody where I was at. Sorry. Philippians 3.3. 3. He says, For we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus. And watch this. And have no confidence in the flesh. Brethren, our confidence is not in our flesh. It cannot be in our flesh. What is our confidence in? Watch Paul begin to break this down. Though I might have confidence in the flesh... If any man thinketh he have whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Now watch Paul. He's just saying, look, if you want to boast about flesh, let me show you my flesh prior to knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me show you how much I had prior to knowing Jesus Christ. And it was not enough. Watch this. Circumcised the eighth day, exactly according to the law. Of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. No, knew exactly the tribe he was from. A Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. Listen, he was strict, right? Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. He was so right that he took the Scriptures literally. Deuteronomy 13, 13 says, That prophet or dreamer to dream shall be put to death, who had spoken to turn thee away from the Lord thy God. And you know what Paul was doing? He was fulfilling that passage. He was killing Christians. He was killing anybody that was contrary to the law. Touching righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Now this righteousness which is in the law is not enough to get you to heaven, y'all. Watch this. But what things were gained to me, those things I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I counted all things <clears throat> but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Verse 9, and be found in Him. Here's Israel again, 
Same problem the nation of Israel had. Paul is exposing it. Uh, not having what? Whose righteousness? Mine own righteousness. If salvation is obtained by your righteousness, guess what? You can lose it. But watch what he says here. And being found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. Watch. The righteousness which is of God by faith. Do you see that? Of God by faith. Listen, righteousness is not of us. It's of God. It comes from God. Go to uh, 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. Very familiar passage, but I don't think people pay attention to what this passage says here. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 5. I know you probably know verse 17, but if you read down past 17, something interesting is said here. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, or, uh, and hath given us the ministry uh, of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. That word imputing is a good study to do. Not imputing. Listen, not imputing means he's not giving you what you deserve. You understand? Not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. Verse number 21, watch this. For He, who's the He? Look, He hath made Him to be sin for us. Who is the He? It's God, who is the Him? It's Jesus, who knew no sin. Watch the wording. That we might be, what's that word? We earn it. We already have enough righteousness. We're made the righteousness of God in Him. We don't earn righteousness. We're not good enough. That the Scriptures is very clear. There's not a just man upon the face there to do a good and sin if not. That's our memory verse for this week. Listen, we're made righteousness. Our righteousness uh, and our, ra our filthy rags, our sin was put on him. His righteousness was given. Oh, preacher, how do you know it was given? Okay, I'm glad you asked. Turn to Romans chapter number 5. But notice it's God's righteousness again. Do you see that? Romans 10, it's God's righteousness. Uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, it's God's righteousness. Philippians chapter 3, it's God's righteousness. All through the scriptures, it is God's righteousness. That's where a lot of people get messed up. And that's why they think they can lose it. Because they don't recognize that it is God's righteousness. It's not yours to begin with. Romans 5. Watch the wording of Romans 5. It'll help you. Romans chapter number 5. We could probably read the entire chapter. It, it would be a good thing for you to go back and read this entire chapter. It talks about how we're justified with God and verse number one how we're justified by faith but let's start at verse number 13 we'll just jump in uh, verse 12 it's hard to find out where's a good place but let's start at verse 12 wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned for until the law was in the uh, law sin was in the world but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that have not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Not as the offense, so also is the... Two words. What is the free gift? We're going to keep reading... He's going to tell you 
what the free gift is. Now, if God gives you a free gift, is it free gift or is it not a free gift? Now, you have to exercise something to receive it, and it's your faith, but once He gives it to you, the gift is yours. Watch. How do we get it? Watch this. For through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God. And notice it's called this again, the gift by grace. He's emphasizing it is a gift, which is by one man, Christ Jesus. How does the gift come? By one man. Christ Jesus hath abounded unto many. Verse 16, And not as uh, it was by one man that sinned, so is the, the gift. For judgment was by one unto condemnation, but the... Watch, he says it again. You see how he's emphasizing that? He said it's a gift, it's, it's a free gift, it's a gift, it's a gift, it's a free gift. Four times he's already mentioned it's a gift. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which received abundance of grace, here's the gift. He's going to tell you what the gift is now. And of the gift of what? It's a gift, y'all. It's a gift of righteousness. We've already established, and we're going to continue to establish, whose righteousness is given. Whose righteousness is given in every passage we've read so far? It's God's righteousness. Given as a free gift. That's why people don't understand it. Because they don't understand true salvation. It makes me wonder. I, I get nervous when people think you can lose it. Because they don't, to me, I'm not saying some of them ain't saved and just don't understand. But to me, you don't understand the true doctrine of salvation if you don't understand it's a free gift to begin with if you think you have to add something to it there's nothing you can add to it there's nothing you can take away from it it's not your goodness and your righteousness you listen your righteousness let me tell you your goodness and your righteousness caused the lord jesus christ to hang on a cross that's how good you are how could we think that our righteousness adds something to salvation that doesn't mean God doesn't expect us to submit and yield to Him and produce good fruit. I'm not ignoring that. That's after salvation. But you don't clean up your life and get better. And, and Now, I'll say this, in my life, there was a time period when I started being, feeling bad about the things I was doing. I started being under conviction about those things. I, the Lord started dealing with me about the way I was living because it's the sin that caused the separation between you and God to begin with. So He's going to deal with you about that. But you can brush all that up and reject Jesus Christ and still go to hell. Because you haven't accepted the free gift. Notice the wording again. We'll, we'll go down to verse number 19. For if by one man's disobedience many were made sinners... So by the obedience of one shall many... Here's the word again. Do you see the word again? What's the word? Many be made... Twice. Do you see that? Already twice in two different texts, he said you're made righteous. It doesn't say you earn it. Go to Romans 4. Romans 4. Chapter before. I want you to see this. Made righteousness, made righteousness, and look what he says here. Romans 4, verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath way up to glory, but not before God. You see what he's saying there? If Abraham was justified by his works, he, he ain't got any place to glory before God, because that's not how righteousness comes. Watch him clear this up. What saith the Scriptures? Abraham believed God because he was righteous. Is that what it says? See, you've got to read it right. Just like it said he was made righteous, made righteous, and here it says his faith was counted for righteousness. It doesn't say Abraham was righteous and deserved anything. 
his faith, God said, I'm going to count that as righteousness. He believes me. He ain't got it all worked out. He's got sin still that he's struggling with. But I'm going to count that as righteousness because he's willing to believe me. That's how it works. Otherwise, you ain't going to heaven. There ain't none of us going to heaven. There's not a single one of us going to heaven if it is based on our righteousness. The most self-righteous... I, listen, I, 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 got, I, I, I was raised in a church, and uh, it was a Wesleyan church, and some of them old-timers there had a, um, had a uh, belief that was called entire sanctification. If you're not entirely sanctified, then you're not saved. You have to get to a point where you got this sinless state. And they would make really messed up statements like this. Man, I haven't sinned for five years. You've lost your mind. You just did. You lied. I'm sorry. You're going to tell me you've gone five years and ain't, ain't lusted after anything? Not just a woman. Ain't lusted after money. Ain't lusted after a car. Ain't lusted after a food. Ain't, ain't been gluttonous. I'm, I know I'm hit on something that we all, I see me suck my stomach in, have a problem with. You're going to tell me you ain't ever lied or exaggerated? You ain't ever done none of that in a year? The Bible says the thought of foolishness is sin. You, you had not had a foolish thought? You had not said, man, in your mind, man, I'd like to go over and slap him. I'm sorry. You, 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 listen, that, that, is, that is the most insane way of thinking. God doesn't give us salvation because we're good. He gives us salvation because Jesus Christ died for sinners. It's a faithful saying worthy of all, uh, uh, all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. God saves us because Jesus died for us and He provided a way even though we're pathetic even after He saves us, we're pathetic. Maybe I ought to say that again because there wasn't enough evidence here. We are. We are. If you're honest. If you're honest. You spend the day going, man, I wish you wouldn't have done that. You may have better days where it's longer in between. Praise the God. It's usually when I'm working that I have those days. I, I find that if I'm busier, I, I sin less. I don't know why that is. I don't know why that is. If I stay busy, if I'm working on cabinets in the house or putting flooring in, blah, blah, I, don't, I have less time to drift. But, even in that, it's funny how sometimes you just slip, hit your finger with the hammer, or I put screws through my hand or something like that. You tell me you don't have a foolish thought? I'm glad I don't have the language I used to have. When I first got saved, I had the language to go along with it. I'm glad that's long, long gone. I don't have that no more. Praise the Lord for that. But listen, our righteousness counts zero in God's book. Now, after you're saved, He expects you to live a holy life and be sanctified. But to think that you ever get to a point where you got it all figured out, honestly, I don't want to be around Christians like that. I don't. Because Christians like that are, are, are liars. They're deceivers. We all, listen, when we come here, we all have one thing in common. We're all sinful. Paul said, that he's waiting on this vile body to be changed. Philippians 3, we just read Philippians 3, his testimony. You know what he says a little bit more later? He says he's waiting on this vile body to be changed. That it may be fashioned. Why would Paul say he's still got a vile body? Why would he say Romans 7, O wretched man that I am? He didn't say, O wretched man that I was. Paul says, O wretched man that I am. Go to Romans chapter number 1. Romans 1. Watch this. Whose righteousness is it so far, brethren? Whose? It's God so far. Watch. It don't change right here. Verse 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. We're kept by whose power? 1 Peter chapter number 1 tells you we're kept by whose power? The power of God. Now watch. The gospel. It is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
For therein is the righteousness of who? Righteousness of the saint? It's the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Through the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Not your righteousness. Through the power of the gospel, His righteousness is revealed in you. It's not our righteousness, y'all. It is God's righteousness as a free gift. Romans chapter 3, let's see it again. Romans is full of these examples. But I'm glad Peter gets in on the action. Right? He gets in and adds stuff to it that helps us. But Paul covers this extensively. Romans chapter number 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. So, you can clean up, you can do whatever you want to do, you're not going to be justified in the sight of God. I don't care how clean you clean up. Notice, by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now watch, verse number 21. But now, the righteousness of who? Do you see it says it again? This, this is a pattern that's repeated over and over and over. And people who believe you can lose it don't understand that it's not your righteousness to begin with. Brethren, we're not preaching our righteousness. We're preaching God's righteousness. Our righteousness is not enough. When you preach to people the gospel, don't you dare point them to yourself. You can use yourself as an illustration, your testimony, to get that thing going, but you are to point them to the righteousness of God and say, hey, look, by faith, that's what we get. Yeah, you're dirty. Yeah, you're rotten. Listen, I, I, I listened to an illustration that really helped me a lot. Helped me a lot uh, just recently. And, um, you know, because I run into this all the time, I don't know how much you, you minister. You've got two, two main groups of people when you door knock or you're in public evangelism. You've got this one group who say, but they, 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 they don't have the fruit of it. You don't see any of that, you know. I'm just saying people who, who struggle with on two different spectrums. You've got the other spectrum over here who think that they're dirty or rotten and they can't ever do anything right. And you know what? That group over there is more reachable. It's much more reachable. Um, and, and I've had them ask me this. And the uh, Lord gave me an illustration of somebody who was preaching recently. And, and it made so much sense. And I have them ask me, why would the Lord want me? And He knows what I do. And so this preacher gave a, an excellent illustration about a navigation system in the car. You got a navigation system in the car? He said this, God never gives up on us. We give up on God, but God doesn't give up on us. He said, he's like that navigation system in your car. He said, you make the wrong turn. And he says, recalculating. He said, this is what you got to do to get back. You make the wrong turn again. And he says, recalculating. He said, eventually that navigation system and the time limit of that navigation system and its power may run out. Your time is limited, he said. you got limited time to make your choice. But God is always rerouting you, trying to get you back in the way, just like that navigation system. Listen, I'm glad He reaches us, He loves us, cares for us. He's trying to get us back in the way. It doesn't matter how far you're going. I've had people say, well, you know what they did? Yeah, but do I know everything about what you did? How about all the secret stuff you did that you didn't tell nobody about? Isn't it amazing how many people want to point out somebody else's flaw? And then in your own life, you're full of flaws yourself? You just hide them better than other people do. I'm telling you, listen, all of us, all of us, man at his best state, the Bible says in Psalm 39, 5, is altogether vanity. Altogether vanity. Look at um, verse 20 again. Therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even, here, he's going to say it again, even the righteousness of God which is by, here's the gospel, faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all that believe, for there is no difference, 
for that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified. What kind of gift is it? It's a free gift. Being justified, how? Freely. By His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be the propitiation through faith in His blood to declare what? What is He declaring? <laughs> Whose righteousness, y'all? Who is His righteous? Who's His? Listen, He said it twice. God's righteousness, righteousness of God, it's His righteousness. If I have anything to declare... I cannot declare I'm saved because of something I did. I cannot declare I lost it because of something I did. I'm declaring God's righteousness. By faith in Jesus Christ, I have obtained God's righteousness, not because I am good and holy, but because He's good and holy, and He knew what was in man. Listen, if He don't provide a way like that, none of us are getting in. We're not. No, none of, there's not a single person that will ever come sit here. I don't The best preacher I can ever invite, the most holy preacher that we can ever invite here, I'm telling you, that preacher's not getting in on his merit. He is not getting in on his merit. I don't care how righteous and holy a person is, we all are sinful and we all need God's righteousness applied to our life or you're not getting in. You're not getting in. It's a misunderstanding. It's amazing how many people misunderstand this doctrine. Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 1. Um, Peter already got in on the action, but he's going to get in on it again. Second Peter. I like First Peter chapter 1 and Second uh, Peter 1. Real quick, like, I want you to grab First Peter 1 and Second Peter 1. First chapter of each one of these. And I want you to read the first verse and tell me what Peter says differently <laughs> in the other verse about himself. 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1. Give you a chance to read it. And 2 Peter 1.1 1, 1. What does Peter say differently about himself? He adds something in 2 Peter. You see what he adds? Peter grew up, didn't he? Peter matured between writing the first chapter here and writing the first chapter in his second epistle. He adds something. A servant and an apostle. Boy, I tell you what, that kind of growth is what you need in your life. You need that kind of growth in your life where you're no longer just an apostle or whatever you are. You're no longer just a saint. You're a servant. That's the way you need to see yourself. Peter has a maturity level here that is, is a blessing to see. Look at verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of who? <laughs> Listen. It is like a broken record, isn't it? Over and over you see that it is not your righteousness. Watch what he says. Peter, a servant of Je uh, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained. Are they obtaining it? Are they trying to obtain it? Is it going to be obtained in the future? Or do they have it? They have it currently. Do you see that? They're not working for it. They're not hoping that, that they get it. They already have it. They've obtained like precious faith with us. You know why we can say we have it? It's not because we're good. It's because, look what it says, like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and of our Savior Jesus Christ. Go to 1 John chapter 5. This is why we can say this. This is why we can say we know. The, the Bible says we can know. And the reason we can know is it's not based on how good we are. It's based on whose righteousness, y'all. We've seen it over and over. It is God's righteousness. Watch what he says here. 1 John 5. Verse 
Look at verse 12, uh, verse 11. This is a record that God hath given to us eternal life. Did He give it to us, or did we earn it? It's a free gift all through the Scriptures, y'all. Given unto us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life. I like, my preacher used to say this, my preacher used to say this all the time. Uh, people say, well, the Bible's hard to understand. Well, here it is in one-syllable words, y'all. One-syllable words. Remember you used to clap in school for syllables? Look at this. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. One syllable is just that simple. Why do we make it so complicated? You either got Him or you don't. Look at the next verse. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may what? Know that ye have eternal life. Know that you're getting eternal life. Or do you already have it? See, if you're saved, you already have eternal life. How do you know, based on what we've studied so far, how do you know you have eternal life? Because of your goodness? How? It's the righteousness of God. We could not know anything if that gift wasn't given to us at salvation. There's no way we could know we're saved. See, the knowledge of knowing you're saved has nothing to do with whether you're good. It's because He's good. Let's go back to Romans chapter number 4. Romans 4, we'll finish right here. Romans 4, we were in Romans 4. I want to highlight uh, what's said just a little bit later here. Verse number 4, Romans 4, 4. Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. Who does he justify? How does he justify them? By their righteousness? Do you see that? What we've learned so far is not their righteousness and goodness. He justifies them. His faith is, here's the word again, his faith is what? Counted for righteousness. Look at the illustration, verse 6. Even as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Imputed righteousness is what we have. What does imputed mean? That means it's given to you. You didn't earn it. It's put on your account. That's what imputed means. You didn't deserve any of it. He imputed it to you. He imputed our sins to Him on that cross. He didn't know any sin, but it was put on Him. And He imputed His righteousness to your account. Your bank account now says God's righteousness. That's what you have now. When God sees you, He sees that righteousness that Jesus Christ died on the cross so you can have. I'm, I'm happy. I'm thankful for that. But I hope this helps some of you realize that it's not about your righteousness. It's about God's righteousness. Let's take a break right here. Next week we'll talk about enemy versus friends. Amen.